Welcome to the Ferguson Library and our Civility in America series, and we're delighted to have Douglas Sprinkley with us tonight. I'd just like to take a moment to ask you to silence your cell phones if you haven't already, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris Brule, who will do the introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back here for, for a really special uh, civility uh, presentation tonight. Um, so, how do we hear, how's that? A little better? Okay. So, in order to uh, maximize our speaker's time, uh, you have had the opportunity to see his bio. I want to just make a, just a couple of quick observations. Uh, seven New York Times bestseller, six best book of the year, uh, a series of major prizes, academic appointment, uh, an endowed chair at Rice, uh, and uh, the opportunity to be regularly on CNN, uh, the U.S. Uh, presidential historian, thank you, at the New York uh, Humanities uh, Historical Society. It, the list goes on. I'm personally fascinated by uh, things that I'm sure will emerge Rolling Stone magazine, uh, the importance of the of the great outdoors uh, in Austin, Texas, where he where he lives with his wife Anne, who was with him, and his three kids who are roaming the library right now. Uh, a, a safer place could never be found. Uh, if you are the kids, who knows if for the library? Uh, but I just wanted to to offer one thought because the word historian uh, is always used to describe uh, Doug Brinkley. Uh, well, we know that. Actually, life becomes history. And, and the dynamism, the excitement, the uncertainty, the emotions, the fear, all of that that adds up to what life is, often disappears uh, when people think of the term history and think back to dates, places, etc. when they think of history texts and historians. The ability to live in, in all moments which is what great historians do, to bring those past moments forward to us. And that past moment might be 20 minutes ago, in terms of context, of the implications of all that we've studied and learned. Um, that's really a remarkable gift. When you combine the depth of scholarship with the willingness to be on cable weekly, you have an in-the-moment opportunity uh, to engage and to be engaged. And so to have that opportunity come to you right here at the Ferguson Library is a testimony to the mission of the library and the willingness of Mr. Brinkley to share his thoughts, his learning, and his civility with us. So, Doug, the floor is yours. Good evening. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. It's a, a great library crowd that came out for me tonight, and I appreciate it. Uh, Bob Dylan Schneider um, of the Civility Lecture sponsor is a friend of mine, and he's been wanting me to do this for a little while now, so I'm glad I was able to come here with my family. I'm spending the month of June up around Hyde Park, New York, so it wasn't that much of a jaunt uh, in here tonight, and we're gonna have a uh, dinner in town with some friends. Um, on the theme of civility, I was going to begin, because we're, when my kids are here, and we're looking at Revolutionary War sites around New England. And I want to mention a name you probably don't know, most of you, from the time of the American Revolution. It's Charles Thompson. Thompson was the secretary for the Continental Congress. So his job was when all of the politicians from all of the colonies had to meet in Philadelphia, he would round them all up there, give them lodging, reimbursements, keep the minutes of, of the uh, Continental Congress. And he did this from 1774 all the way to the 1790s. And his um, genius was he was the Sam Adams of Philadelphia. He was the biggest brewer in America. He was a lawyer who represented Native American land rights, and he was the head of the Sons of Liberty of Philadelphia, just like Sam Adams was up in Boston. So he was a firebrand intellectual. And the name you should know, because on the original Declaration of Independence of July 4th, when it basically is a, a release to the world that the United States is being, being created, um, 
Two names are on it, John Hancock and Charles Thompson. And in fact, Thompson's the one who, when the printing of it got done, he stood at Independence Hall and read it uh, out to a little gaggle of reporters about a new country being uh, established. In fact, it's Charles Thompson who picked the eagle to be our national symbol. Ben Franklin wanted the wild turkey. And they, 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 he won. And Thompson actually designed the great seal of the United States. It's almost like a stencil kit America's being created, you know, just get it, getting our nation's great seal. And during the crucible of the American Revolution, George Washington was not interested in Thomas Jefferson in Virginia and what grapes he was growing and what music he was playing and how much philosophy he read, nor was he interested in what John Adams had to say about the rights of man and liberty. He needed money. Um, Washington needed procurement, blankets, medicine, you know, foodstuffs to supply the, the, um, the, his, uh, the Continental Army. And Thompson was the guy as head of the Continental Congress that would find how to fund George Washington's army. When Washington's stuck at Valley Forge, he's pleading to Charles Thompson to get him financial help, to get him supplies, and Thompson did it all. He was indispensable. And at the end of the American Revolution, after the Battle of Yorktown, it is Charles Thompson who goes to Mount Vernon, Virginia to tell George Washington, you're it. You've got to be the president of the United States. You're the one figure that can unite these different colonies, including some with slavery and some without slavery. And you are the one figure that has the, the credential. You're a folk hero to the new country, the father of the United States of America. And when Washington comes to New York for our country's first presidential inauguration, took place in Wall Street, it is Charles Thompson standing at his side. Um, yet, uh, he, there was no role for him in the Washington administration because he wanted uh, women to have equal rights and abolition of slavery. And there was no role um, for Thompson because he was like Thomas Paine, seen as being too radical. So he lived his life in Philadelphia and he had uh, and then moved out near Bryn Mawr, where the college is, and they had, he had kept all of these volumes of minutes of the founding of our country and diaries. And he was setting down to write the multiple volume history of the founding of the United States as the as the um, owner of the, all that primary material. And then the 1800 election happened when Thomas Jefferson, a Democrat Republican, ran against John Adams, the Federalist, and they went at each other. It was as bad, it was the, in, in tone as Trump versus Hillary Clinton. They were, it, and Charles Thompson panicked and starts saying, we're never going to survive in the United States because we are now destroying each other. Nobody in the Constitution had said there are two political parties. They, there are modern political parties developed in 1800 in, the, in this election. And Charles Thompson didn't like what he saw. And so he ended up writing Jefferson and writing Jay that unless we make presidents into a major building, uh, uh, once they're elected, we put all animosity away. We'll, we and build a really strong executive, our country will um, melt away in hatred um, because these, you're st setting these two parties up for warfare like that. And he knew how Jefferson and Adams and others had been loyal to the British crown for a long time. All the things they said in his diaries, he would have been like an expose on them if it got out. And he decided we had to build Washington up as the founder of the country and build all presidents up. And he burned the founding papers. Uh, Jefferson would later say it had to have been an act of dementia. Um, nobody could quite, but his rationale was that we, without civility, 
we won't make it as a country. We cannot be in a constant state of political warfare that you have to say. And the only way to do it is build presidents up. And so I do presidential history. And you know, if I go here to New York and try to get a contract to do a book on Sam Rayburn or um, you know, um, Felix Frankfurter, I will not get any money. If I say I want to do a book on a president, boom, we'll sign you. Because we all share presidents. We, we make our time. The, 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 the Nixon years, you know, you know, the Reagan years, the Trump, age of Trump. I mean, we just do it. And in fact, we take, give secret service. One of them is here tonight for presidents and first ladies, first families. We save their birthplaces. We save their boyhood homes. We, we create presidential libraries. I was recently in Plains, Georgia, where I saw the plaque that this is where Jimmy Carter was conceived. <laughs> so we make a cult out of the presidency in the United States, and it's why uh, what Thompson was saying is not, let, forget the District of Columbia, name it Washington. Have Washington's on our quarter. He's on the dollar in your pocket. And Lincoln, there's a bookstore in Chicago that only sells Lincoln books. And so, the, and when we don't have a civility after an election, bad problems happen in the sense that Lincoln won in 1860 and he wasn't on the ballot in seven southern states, and he was not seen as a real president. And it creates a climate of, of, of incivility. Uh, we've had a problem in the 21st century when Al Gore ran against George W. Bush, when Gore wins the popular vote, and Bush, um, I mean, and Bush wins the electoral vote, and then a Supreme Court has to decide many people on the Democrats didn't take Bush as being a serious president. He's not real. He shouldn't have been in the White House. And so it's a constant climate of dissent. And we saw that our last cycle in 2016, where Hillary Clinton wins by 3 million um, votes, but Donald Trump becomes president. And it creates a natural anger because we've been gypped, we've been ripped off, and you're not a real president because you didn't get elected in, in, a, in a fulsome way. Um, so with that said, I chose, because of my limited time and my new book out, to pick a moment of civility with the, after the election of 1960, which saw um, um, John F. Kennedy run against Richard Nixon. Many people talk about 1960. They will say it was our country's first televised debate. It was our first presidential debate, period. We don't do presidential debates up until uh, 1960. Lincoln Douglas was about Illinois. Um, and then you all invariably have heard people will say that if Nixon, Nixon won the debates, if you listen on radio, Kennedy won on television. Uh, but if you go back, like I had to do for this book, you want to see civility in debating, uh, go look at Nixon and Kennedy, how they treated each other uh, with such utter respect. The hardest line Kennedy had on Nixon was saying, I, if you're elected president, I see a Soviet flag planted on the moon. I want an American flag planted on the moon. But that's about it. I mean, because, and then that election in 1960, Richard Nixon, who's in the news now for Watergate and uh, for nefarious activities, and I edited his um, tapes where he uses foul language and anti-Semitism and all, but in 1960, Nixon really barely lost by a hair of a hair. And Kennedy had picked Lyndon Johnson, who he didn't like as his vice president, and he barely was able to grab a hold of Texas Kennedy in 1960. And the cemetery vote came out in Illinois for Kennedy. And many people said Nixon got cheated and he needed to... Um, to re challenge the election revolts, and Nixon said, no, that would not be good for our country in 1960. I can't do that. I'll be seen as a sore loser. And suddenly, Jack Kennedy gives that great speech of civility and public service as inaugural, 
And we had, as in 1960, the one of the closest elections ever, but once Kennedy's president, he, he runs with a 70% approval rating, up to 75% pro approval rating. That's how we got to the moon. Uh, because it was bipartisan, people said, this is Kennedy's gambit and we're going to back it. Um, now, um, in my book, American Moonshot, I talk about what the Cold War climate that made Kennedy pick going to the moon. Uh, but it was, in the end, all about wanting to beat the Soviets and about seeing that public uh, uh, discovery and the need for scientists. On Kennedy's watch, in April of 1961, the Soviets put the first human in space in Yuri Gagarin. And Kennedy wanted a counterstatement. And his counterstatement was um, Alan Shepard on May 5th, 1961. And then Kennedy surprised everybody, goes to Capitol Hill, calls a joint session of Congress, and says on May 25th, 1961, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and bring him back alive. You know what they said at NASA that moment? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> We've got no technology. And Kennedy could have gotten firebombed by, by Republicans for recklessness of rhetoric. His own national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, after the speech, pigeonholed the president and said, that what you did is a grandstanding ploy. And Kennedy said, Mac, you don't run for president in your 40s if you don't have a certain kind of moxie. But the reason we got to the moon is once Kennedy said it, he went, met with Republicans, and we got congressional appropriations for the Apollo project. The big slogan at NASA was, no bucks, no buck Rogers. We can't go to the moon if it's not bipartisan, if Democrats and Republicans can't pull together and unite as the country in a peaceful race to the moon to show the advantages of democratic um, liberalism and uh, capitalism versus Soviet totalitarianism and communism. And so we united in it. And when you got, look at the story I tell the moon, nobody cares who's a Republican or Democrat. We didn't ask for party affiliation in World War II when people died at Iwo Jima and Normandy. Most of these astronauts that went up were Republican and they worshiped their Democratic president. Um, it just didn't matter because we had the moonshot, a collective endeavor that would pull the United States together and get out of that vicious squabbling that Charles Thompson had so worried about following our presidential elections. Incidentally, I know you all know the term moonshot. Um, it's now part of our, our parlance. Uh, it actually comes from Major League Baseball. It was a man named Wally Moon for the Los Angeles Dodgers that would hit towering home runs in the LA Coliseum in the late 1950s. And Vince Scully, the announcer, would say, there it goes, left field, it's a moonshot over the right field fence. And, and um, NASA, which was created in 1958 as a civilian agency, not a military agency, adopted the term moonshot for their Houston headquarters, calling it the Moonshot Command Post. Now, in the name of civility, in order to fund all of that, $25 billion to go to the moon, it's $180 billion in today's terms. Um, when it wasn't necessary, we just decided to do it because it was good for the spirit of America to work together on such an endeavor. Everybody cheered when Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and Scott Carpenter and John Glenn and other Mercury astronauts uh, went into space. Some people thought the money should have been spent at home. Martin Luther King Jr.'s great um, sidekick uh, the great Reverend Ralph Abernathy kept protesting that money could go to urban poverty and take care of kids. Why are we going to the moon? But the day the moon shouts or any of these well, space launches took place, Abernathy applauded the astronauts themselves and the, and the collective American spirit. Um, the, 
we, we pulled, to, we just didn't have the knives out back then in 1960 for each other. That somebody like Nixon and Kennedy who did not like each other could nevertheless behave towards each other with such civility. In World War II, we saw with Franklin D. Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, for example. Even Dwight Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson in the 50s. Um, so when did it get to the, the B that we couldn't come up with collective efforts? And incidentally, with the anniversary of going to the moon, it was, uh, Neil Armstrong's July 20th, 1969. So I'm sure you all know that that's this summer's the big 50th. And, um, and it, one thing you sh I, you're not going to hear on these documentaries or, or things, if you want to talk about real civility, when we all know what Neil Armstrong said when he went on the moon, that's one small step you know, for a man, one giant leap for mankind. You know what he said when we were leaving the moon? You know, it was an eight day mission Apollo. We had just done the moon with uh, Armstrong and Aldrin, uh, 550 million people worldwide watching on television, pulling for them to pull it off. And you can watch or here, Armstrong's climbing up the ladder in that bulky suit, and you hear him say, did you leave the packet? And Aldrin suddenly drops a little something on the moon. In that were medals, in that little package, beyond Apollo, uh, Apollo medals, but there were medals to all of the Soviet cosmonauts who died in the space race, trying to go to the moon as a way that the United States could honor um, the Russians. Because without a, a friendly competition, not war, a scientific push between two adversaries, you know, we would not have, um, you know, we wouldn't have been there. That's an olive branch. That is showing international civility of a very kind of high order. That's the opposite of names calling or gloating or mocking, um, but showing that we can have differences with countries, but, but we honor what they, they were able to do. Um, but with the, when John F. Kennedy, um, days before his life, um, you know, the day actually before he was killed, he was in San Antonio, Texas. And some people were starting to not want to go to the moon and questioning Apollo. And Kennedy gives a great speech, says, we've got to. We are all in it. We're all Americans. We've decided on this number. It's bipartisan. We've tossed our cap over the wall. And now we have to go climb up and get it. I mean, we've got to continue and we've got to persevere. He also talked about the spin-off technology we got from going to the moon that Kennedy said is going to help all Americans, no matter of political persuasion. GPS emerges out of NASA. Anti-icing devices. Uh, biomedical miracles like CAT scans, MRI, kidney dialysis machines, heart defibrillators, firefighter suits that we use today that from materials developed to send astronauts into space. The point was we decided to do something just like the 13 colonies needed to stand up against Britain. We all decided to break the shackles of planet Earth. We're going to do, Americans will be first, but we're doing it in the name of peace for all mankind. On the day Kennedy was killed in Dallas, he was on his way to the trademark to give a speech about uh, how much space was the new ocean, um, the new sea, how the Magellans and Columbuses of today were the astronauts, and how satellites are going to change our life, how we can talk to people internationally by telephone calls that we had we started in 1962, beaming the first images around the world. He never got to give that speech. But um, Jackie Kennedy kept up the cause. I mean, we all know when she was killed, uh, when her husband was killed, she was wearing that pink Chanel suit, blood all over her, a makeshift ceremony on Air Force One where Lyndon Johnson's being sworn in. And at the burial of JFK at Arlington National Cemetery, there was a, um, a uh, John Glenn, the astronaut was one of the pallbearers, um, Ethel Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's wife, still alive, friend of mine, 
she told me that when her, her husband, RFK, was murdered in Los Angeles in 68, one of the first things she did was to get away from the scene to call John Glenn to go look after her children at Hickory Hill in Virginia. Glenn had become that much part of the Kennedy family. But um, Jackie Kennedy's first meeting with Lyndon and, and Lady Bird after her husband's death, she said, I want you to keep Jack's dream alive. And throughout the 1960s, the decade that we use the word tumultuous 60s, when we had urban riots, when we were, um, had doves and hawks in Southeast Asia, when we had um, racial strife of every kind, the Apollo program continued to be something that united the American people and became JFK's great bipartisan legacy. Uh, it almost got derailed for funding in the 60s because in 1967 you had Apollo 1 in which three astronauts were blown up at the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Roger Chafee, Ed White, and Gus Grissom. And a lot of people said, um, a, you know, geez, why are we have to fulfill Kennedy's pledge? But Republicans, Republican senators and people in Congress said no, it, because we did it, Kennedy called it for all of us and we're gonna finish Kennedy's, um, you know, Kennedy's um, policy, Kennedy's dream. Um, Republicans could have derailed it as a Kennedy thing and instead they kept it going. And as you know, in 1969, Richard Nixon was president, and, um, and Nixon had to write. I, I got to do the official oral history of Neil Armstrong for NASA, and the, I could do hours of lectures on all of that, but the one thing that stood out to me is Armstrong said I had a 50-50 chance of it working, um, and that it was that high risk. But um, we, uh, Nixon was president and that incredible moment of Armstrong, but we, you know, the, the real thing was can we bring them back alive? One of the problems with Russia is they were very good at space science and putting things up in the space, but they were less good about re-entry. In fact, they had put the first creature in space like a dog in the 50s, and uh, the dog incinerated in space. Uh, um, they, they didn't have a plan to bring the dog back. There was no PETA in, in Russia at that time. Um, and, and when they finally came, Armstrong, Michael Collins, who I was with last week, wonderful person, still with us, Buzz Aldrin, when they were all gathered and they're aboard the Hornet at Mission Control in Houston, they put on the big board Kennedy's Moon Pledge of 1961 and then said, mission accomplished. Um, in, um, in July of 1969, and the American people fell whole. Whatever was divisive, you know, um, unified us for a while um, during Apollo 11. So when I'm looking at the term and what it would, of our la I don't even have to get into why we are losing civility all the time, I'm also asking ourselves on this 50th anniversary, beyond honoring Kennedy, beyond honoring the 400,000 engineers and chemists and computer specialists who um, brought us to the moon, um, but I'm, I'm wondering what is the next moonshot? What is it, how can we pull together short of war? I mean, we often hear in history about war uh, as pulling the country together, but that's only true of, um, of wars of necessity. Like when World War II, I mean, Hitler declared war on us. Japan bombed us. Yes, we're all in it together and we pulled together. But when you have wars of preference, Korea destroyed Truman's administration. He couldn't even run for president re-election in 1952. Vietnam destroyed Johnson and Nixon, the Iraq War of George W. Bush um, drug on and tore the country into two. If you're going to do wars of, of choice, um, they need to be quick because the longer a war goes on, the more people start uh, fighting. Um, 
and so the, we don't want war to bring us together. Um, President Trump just avoided um, a potential war in Iran, which would have been devastating. What, what is the new moonshot? And I go around and talk to a lot of people um, since my book comes out. And what I hear from folks is there's a group of people that still believe that the answers are in space, that Kennedy had called his administration the new frontier, the idea that space is a new frontier, and now we're going to go further. And these are the Mars people. The new Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins will flat out tell you the new moonshot is a Mars shot. There's nothing like human beings going on to Mars. Okay. Joe Biden, leading the Democratic Party nom for nominee now, he uses the term moonshot to talk about a war on cancer. That we can pull together. Cancer affects all of us. Everybody here knows somebody that's either died or is sick with cancer or, or you're under a treatment for skin cancer or something right now. And Biden said, let's work with all the hospitals, universities, and make it a war on cancer. Um, the, the Democratic left has been talking about a Green New Deal. And the Green New, um, yet the, the Green New Deal is the idea, in some ways, of an earth shot. That we're living in the age of climate change. And that... Um, and that, you know, without our rivers and lakes, most of the astronauts looking back at, down at Earth s thought they, how lonely and fragile Earth was. How we're the only planet that, that has life that we know of at this point in our entire solar system. Um, and so, you know, may, the idea of saving planet Earth is in the works right now. But that's hard. Because on the, you have about the Republican Party of today isn't interested in climate change. Because no longer are scientists and empirical data free from the lack of incivility. When Kennedy and Nixon ran in 1960, scientists that year were chosen as Times Persons of the Year. Scientists. A uniting factor in civility is people would say, well, what, what's the scientific evidence? And you would, both parties, both Democrat, Republican, Independent, you would accept this sort of scientific uh, empirical data. Today, we don't, we have incivility where we diss and beat up on scientists if it's not convenient to our way of thinking. Um, there used to be, I wrote a biography of Walter Cronkite, who was the big cheerleader of Kennedy's space program and uh, was the big broadcaster for Apollo 11. And, you know, um, and Cronkite, when he resigned from CBS News in 1981, his last interview was Ronald Reagan in the White House, March of 1981, journalists had about a 70% approval rating. Um, many people trusted what their reporters. It's like 12% right now. So there's an institution in decline. Congress, when I'm talking about the funding of Apollo, had giants on the Democratic and Republican Party, people like Everett Dirksen or Scoop Jackson. And, and today, Congress has like a 15% approval rating. Um, it's a sea of distrust. Nobody, you know, a Bob Dylan, who he was inferring, I wrote, a, he was asking me about a cover story I wrote. Uh, after all of that kind of inclusiveness of the 60s, by the time of the 1980s, started writing, if you want somebody to, you can trust, trust yourself um, on a song. That might be where we're at now. Most people here tonight probably trust themselves. But how do we trust the community? How do we trust the state? How do we trust people that disagree with us? Um, and it is, I think, the big challenge of our, our age. My answers will be ones that will you would expect from a historian, and then I'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, I think we got to get back to teaching civility in the public schools, in elementary school, middle school, and high school. We have to return to civics classes. Um, we have to 
teach geography. We have to go back to educating young people. And we cannot just turn over iPhones and electronic devices to 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds who have no idea what sites they're ricocheting around going into hate sites, perverted sites, nasty language, brutality. But parents, including ourselves, we kind of get, say, okay, well, they're, they're, all those kids are doing tech today. So we should be have a course in high school that's mandatory in public schools to learn how to use the internet properly. Um, and, and just, it has to become a mandatory. You can't put the genie of the technology revolution back in the bottle and go back to a different time. It's here to stay and it's gonna keep increasing. But we can educate people because parents and older people assume a young person knows like, oh, well, the Associated Press is the real news, but this site, you know, they don't know what. They're just getting bombarded from all sorts of um, ugly falsehoods. And unfortunately, you get known in today's social media world by being, the, by, by being day glow in your lack of civility, by being as, as weird and nasty and being as much as a provocateur as humanly possible is how you make your career go for you. If I, you know, any time, that's the guiding principle of cable television and all, say something really out there. If you say something very sane, oh, it's a yawn. Well, so we're kind of just going further and further and further uh, saying really incendiary things, trashing people, showing no sense of honor, not, um, not behaving um, with a, in a sense of the, what Dr. King would call the beloved community. We're not operating on behalf of the beloved community. We're, ap we're operating on jealousy, envy, hatred, destruction. And so it's going to be up. The only solution is back to education, back to public libraries, back to getting young people to learn the art of civility instead of expecting them to suddenly be civil when we're allowing this um, media technology world to be so brutal on uh, our, our fellow citizens. Uh, we, we, const we now are desperate to heal after Nixon and Watergate and Vietnam and all that, Jerry Ford became president and his name of his memoir is A Time to Heal. And then Jimmy Carter was president, wrote a memoir, Keeping Faith. Um, there's some moments in American history that the acrimony has to die down. Uh, it may take something that we unthinkably bad to happen till we wake up to it. But we're right now, our crescendo's too high. We're, we're, it, it, you can feel the unhealthiness um, in the air um, in the United States. And we'll get through all this. But, uh, and it's not just a matter of blaming one party or the other. Um, or, or, you know, industry versus agriculture and all this. It's, it's all of us. We've allowed civility to be a, a, to fall way down on the back burner and have, have not been able to do what two of our founders did. I mentioned to you, 1800, that he burned the diaries, Charles Thompson, because Adams and Jefferson were like this they recognized the importance of civility after that election. And one of the best books in American history is their collected correspondence, where from their old age, with all of their differences, and mainly Adams believed the American Revolution started in Boston, and Jefferson believed it started in Virginia with Patrick Henry. And they, they had a total different interpretation of how the American Revolution started, they wrote beautiful correspondence to each other, healing that wound, um, uniting the country, and leaving it as, as the founding document of American civility, the letters of Adams and Jefferson that grew out of the, the hatred that marshaled itself in the election of 1800. Thank you.
Thank you so much. We certainly have time for questions. And we have a mic that will come to you. Hi. Um, about your comment that we have to start teaching civility again in the schools, it would probably be good if we started teaching government civics too. But what, what concerns me is that realistically, um, the, the idea of call out, which is attacking people in the universities, got so strong that I have a friend in, my, in her 30s who is uh, going to Naropa University Boulder. A Buddhist school there, right. Yeah. That, and this is what's so interesting about it. It's a Buddhist-oriented She is uh, studying psychology combined with spirituality. So they, they take that approach. And they actually have classes there in call-out. Not analyzing, but teaching the students how to do it and how to create what they call a hierarchy of oppression, meaning that the students who can claim that they are the most oppressed are, are allowed to just shut the conversation by anyone who comes from a group who is less. In other words, women can't make comments to blacks because blacks are more oppressed. And my question is, in a world where it's to that extent, how do you go about just starting classes in it can't just be in the younger class. It needs to be in the college. Well, um, we, we've done some great things. I mean, we do try to teach tolerance in the United States. I mean, we just now, I'm up on the Hudson River and was crossing um, from Poughkeepsie over driving then to Kingston. And you saw that for gay pride, you, we had the, um, the bridge there lit up. These are communities that have greenlit uh, LGBTQ um, understanding that wasn't there before, gay marriage that wasn't there before. Um, and we're teaching tolerance um, towards each other. And, and many, we have many great teachers, but we seem to lose too many. I'm not down on the generation of today because there are millions of young people that, that are tolerant, that do show empathy, that are courteous, but there are too many that are jump in the grid and it, often it becomes due to a divorced family, a broken home, alcoholism, lack of parental supervision. So the schools just have to start, I think, state by state, taking the idea of civics, class on the art of civility seriously and talk about how it, instead of just saying you must be that. I don't find it civil to, all, when an, I see a senior person in their 80s who might say to some, um, some woman, um, um, oh, good morning, darling. And then to say, you are a misogynist, da, 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 you call me darling, you can't, that, you know, that's not civility to just browbeat people that make mistakes. On the other hand, um, we have to learn how to treat women properly um, in, a, in what had been a male-oriented culture. So the solution is football teams all over the country when the players are there, coming from all different backgrounds in life, some of them very hard scrabbled things, they take classes on how to treat and talk to women, to young men that are 18, 19, 20, and 21 years old. Am I allowed to open a door? Uh, in the South, if I see one of you here down in the South, you go, you give kisses. Some of Europe does. And then if you do that to the wrong person, you're like, well, they, they're angry at you. So we just need to kind of have a, an understanding um, and, and, and start recognizing more when, you know, what our soldiers stand for, that we're, you know, the freedom of expression to a degree, but to love our fellow citizens. We've got to all go back to kind of loving each other. And from this side of the room, I saw a hand. No? And back over here. Just wanted to uh, continue on what the lady here was saying. You know, when I first started college, we were one of our core courses the first two years. You had to take Western Civ. And I had my daughter graduated from Columbia University, and I happened to mention something about Irwin Rommel. And she said, Dad, who was that? And I'm, I was a history major like you, and if you know, you're, you're doomed to repeat history if you don't know it. And... It would seem to me that in the colleges today, perhaps for the first two years, maybe it should be a requirement that you take these, these, these courses. And, you know, and, and also professors should be objective 
instead of being political when they're in there. I mean, I know where my daughter went to school at Columbia. It's very left and everything else. When I was in school, we, they didn't. it wasn't that way at all. So I, I have thought a little bit about the civility thing, and I just wonder what do you think of this idea, which is uh, to try to bring back uh, civil service in lieu of a draft, to have like all 18-year-olds uh, give 18 months uh, to their country in some sort form of civil service who would bring people together from various backgrounds and ethnicities to have to work cooperatively in different communities around the country would hopefully build up some spirit, uh, a sense of patriotism. Uh, and we just don't have anything like that. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I wrote a book once called Rightful Heritage on FDR, and I was amazed at how the Civilian Conservation Corps worked. I mean, from 1933 to 1942, people that, uh, from all walks of life, young people would come and work to plant trees and fix up the environment. They planted three billion trees from 1933 to 42, but they were all forced to go into outdoor camps, get together, meet with different nationalities, have a common goal and objective. You know, when if I'm was dabbling a little here in presidential history. Most of presidential history, candidates like your presidents become, had military records of leadership to look on. Without a draft, you know, it's, it's, everything's fragmented. There's not one united uh, culture and the art of, and the thought of public service has been denigrated. I mean, when John F. Kennedy's asking not, you know, ask not, you know, um, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. How do you participate in our democracy? And we need to find ways for young people to do that, as you suggest. We've done a job core, and we do, do some of these things, but they, they don't have the, the kind of a pop moonshot feel to it. I guess what I'm saying is I think that the key of civility may be getting to the young kids early um, in the next wave and try to fix our, um, our, the way, we, we have so many choices of things and we're kind of doing concierge service for students often when we need to create a kind of bedrock platform of uh, what is Congress, what is, uh, you know, what is uh, freedom of speech, what is, um, you know, the, our, our constitutional imperatives, what is the town hall um, meetings all about, just basic um, understanding. Otherwise, you're going to have like you know I don't know who Rommel is, and I'm and uh, but you know we're not we're not doing an effective job of giving history literacy. I'm talking about the moonshot. Do you realize it's like 30 percent of Americans think it was a hoax? I mean, we all make fun of those conspiracy people, but that's a lot of our fellow. There's something lacking in the education system that's allowed that. Numbers. Uh, there's always going to be the the wacko few percents, you know. But when you're getting those high numbers on something like that, um, it, it, you do have to feel that we're not doing the right thing in the teaching realm. Yeah. So, you know, we're at a moment of crisis now, and this is. You know, we can't write off the next 10, 15 years. And I think what, you're fo what you've mentioned is something long-term strategic, but we need tactical right now as to how to not just avert a crisis, but uh, tackle a crisis to survive. You know, over the next year, two years, four years, uh, you know, we really are in crisis mode now. And uh, it's obvious, obvious that the justice past week Things, tensions, international tensions, domestic tensions. I mean, some people, more than some people, are concerned about you know, violence in, in this country. Well, uh, uh, yes. Uh, Had violence. Yeah. I mean, one of the, um, I always say, like, one of the points of history is to remind us that our own times aren't, aren't uniquely oppressive. We can start really being down on ourselves that, oh, my God, this is so bad. Our countries, we're losing grip. We're coming... The American decline. Uh, no, we're not. 
our research and development's great, our colleges are great, we're just leaving too many people behind. The people that we have too, too many people that are haves that don't care about the have-nots. These are problems uh, that can be mended. Um, on a short-term basis, though, I don't know. I wish I knew what we could magically do to kind of change this term, but you're seeing it with lawsuits on Facebook, finding ways. I mean, the social media is a problem. It's creating, it, unsupervised social media creates hate platforms, and everybody, you get to be a coward. You would not believe when you're on CNN what people write. On, you know, I'm not on Twitter, I don't want to read it. They're the cruelest, meanest things you can get. They don't have the nerve to tell you to your face. They're hiding behind that and other people are reading it and then you try to be the me meaner than that and uh, there's no incentive for the, the civility comment or the um, olive branch or the bridge building because all of the high octane energy is in the uh, takedown. Um, and, and then we're, we're starting to too often try to destroy people's characters and focus on their one mistake in life or their big problem um, and, and allow that to be the lead and not the, the, I think, the full scope of a person's life. There is, we need redemption. Yeah. I think we'll have. I have a simplistic question. Are you familiar with Edmund Burke's uh, famous quote on manners? Why not have your publish have every publish put that as a bookmark in every book they publish every student textbook? Maybe only one or two or three percent of the people who read it get it, but that's great improvement. I like the idea. Simple way of yeah, and and libraries can and take you're not a, banging it over their head. Yeah, no, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, and, and yes. Do we have time for one, other? one more? I'll let her pick somebody. Here you go. We'll grab both Hi. of you there. I'd I'll just like to two. switch gears and act, ask about your, your research process. Uh, Robert Carroll's great book on working. He talks a lot about these lucky accidents. So I assume there was something you were looking for, couldn't find, and then some through some element of synchronicity or magic or whatever you want to call it occurred. I'm wondering if you could share one of those. Well, when I was writing this book, American Moonshot, they had not yet released these tapes at the John F. Kennedy Library. And lo and behold, while I was working on the book, like a miracle, these tape-recorded conversations between Kennedy and James Webb, the head of NASA, appeared. And they're really interesting. They're deeply interesting. It was like a gift from the heavens once I started getting it. On, as Carol points out, this happens an awful lot. In fact, I grew up in Perrysburg, Ohio. Um, Neil Armstrong grew up in Wapakoneta, Ohio. I was eight and a half years old when we landed on the moon. And I wrote a, a, um, just a silly letter to Neil Armstrong after I wrote my first book on Dean Acheson for Yale University Press. It was my doctoral dissertation, Truman Secretary of State. Then I wrote a book called Driven Patriot, The Life and Times of James Forrestal. Secretary of the Navy and first Secretary of Defense. I got Armstrong's P.O. box and I um, autographed two copies of my book and sent it to it. And I got a little note back from his assistant that said, Mr. Armstrong will read one of the two books he sent. <laughs> and then it said he doesn't, I was asking for to interview him because I grew up near him. And I said, and he said he doesn't do any interviews, but we'll keep you in mind, blah, blah, blah. A, a plight blow off. Seven years later, I get a telephone call from NASA, George Abbey, that Neil Armstrong has turned 70 years old and he wants me to do his official oral history interview. Um, yeah, I know, it was cool. <laughs> And he did it. He, I mean, I spent eight hours with him, talking with him, and uh, it was a thrill for me because I remember so much watching the local guy go to the moon. So, all right, thank you all. <laughs> Incidentally, my, my, my wife Anne's in the first row up here. She could say hello to her. If you could start, thank you. Uh, 
I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to offer one, one last thought. Uh, the observations about social media, the internet, and civility, uh, it brings to mind the Supreme Court uh, decision, which uh, limited free speech with the, with the phrase that lives on, of course, we don't have the right to cry fire in a crowded theater. So today I would suggest that uh, social media has put us all in a crowded theater. And so the question has become, what do we have the right to say in that theater? It cannot be unlimited. So thank you so much for a really compelling thoughts. Come buy a book, have it inscribed, and say a few words. Yes.